Uh, thank you, thank you, Ron and the others for organizing this, uh, this, this symposium. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion part, but not really my own part. So I try to make it really quick, and uh, that might I might gloss over some of the, the 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 details of the methods of the things that I've done. But if I make it too incomprehensible, please stop. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm also not going to dwell on this, on adolescence, I think a lot of people know. Adolescence is a very interesting period, we have all these things happening at the same time. In this talk, I'm going to focus on this change in impulsive behavior, and it's somewhat related, I guess, uh, and I, I, I really see some connections between this talk. And um, uh, what I've learned now is that it's, I wanted to say, like, over a decade, but I don't know it's actually decades. We have been looking at the brain, also trying to understand uh, uh, where these changes in behavior in adolescence are coming from and how that's related to the changes in the brain. And I think one of the things, that, and, and we keep advancing, and here's a, a couple of the models, and some of them are old, and some that are being updated, and they're being criticized, and I think we're advancing in that, in that respect. That one of the things I just want to highlight is that what, we, what I get from this is that we start to learn that we have all these different, different circuits, and that we're not only starting to look at you know, local activation within them, but really looking at all the connections and, and within and between these different networks. And it's already, I think, in that paper in 2010, by Beatley and Rita Somerville, uh, highlighted that we have to understand how these connections also change and what sort of motivation of some of the work that I'm going to show you. Then I just want to say something about the uh, intentional choice task. That's the task that I've been using and many others actually do study this behavior. And I think it's a very easy task, a lot of people might know it. I think it's actually deceptively easy. It, it seems uh, simpler than it is if you really dive into it. But the basic uh, search of the task is always the same. There's two choices. You can choose some money now, or you can choose to get a large amount of money in the future. And you look at a whole bunch of those choices, and um, you know the, the amount in the future might be larger, it might be smaller, it might be farther away in the future or closer. And from the answers that you give in such a task, you can learn basically how impulsive you are, or that is how much you discount the value of a certain amount of money the further it is into the future. And there's different ways of looking at this. One of the more popular ones would be the hyperbolic discounting model. It's not that important, I think. Um, what works really well, as well as other measures, as area under the curve, I think it's not really interesting for now, is that what you get is a number, uh, and in this case that's a discount factor that really nicely quantifies the level of impulsivity, impulsivity within the person and it is made sure it's compared to people uh, which is basically on this scale. Um, and, and, and using this task and, and this sort of model, and it's been very successful because uh, many studies have shown that populations that we, you know, we actually already knew that were more impulsive are also more impulsive in this task. So it's definitely capturing something interesting. Uh, the point is, and it's just a minor point that I like to make it, it's sort of a hang of mine, is that this discounting model is not really a model of you know, cognition or a, a psychological process, it's really a model of behavior. It's just you're describing behavior in a simple way. Uh, and what that means is that you, um, basically, if we talk about the discount factor, what I sometimes see in the literature is that people say, uh, well, children are more impulsive because they have a higher discount factor. They're so basically saying the same thing twice. Right? So the idea is that even if we can now measure really nicely, uh, you know, this, 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 this K or this discount factor is the output of a whole bunch of different processes. And we don't know what those processes are. And we have many ideas. Uh, but we also, for instance, do not think that addicts um, and ADHD, or children with ADHD or regular children versus adults all have the same sort of psychological process underlying that difference in um, that impulsivity. So, um, uh, many studies already before we uh, have shown that there is indeed also, if you look at development, there's this decrease in the discount factor, so that's maybe important. If it's smaller, the less impulsive it is, lying the more impulsive it is. And now the way to understand this, I think there's a different way. One, uh, one of them is looking at um, you know, other self-report measures or, or uh, 
something that is different from the skills that underlie uh, this ability as a to choose the life later or a better to be more patient. And I think in the literature there's a little bit the two strands of looking at this. And one is very classic and it's been shown also uh, in a couple of studies. Sort of this idea of the change in motivation across development, in motivation to strive for future goals. And that is, if you look at that and measure that in different ways, you can see that it's also correlated with the discount factor within this task. And other people have suggested it's more like a self control, impulse control kind of mechanism that you have to really inhibit going for the immediate results when it's present, and then you know, it's more like the stop signal reaction time. Or more like a motor inhibition. And, well, these are two possible options, of course. And uh, one way of also getting at this, I think, and uh, trying to understand how this all relates, is also looking at the brain. And then we can maybe, if we try to integrate these different pieces, we can get a better understanding of the real mechanism that underlies the development of change. Now, what we need to do, I also think, and uh, what we try to do here, is really leverage the knowledge that we have uh, about this cortical stradial system, or uh, um, what is shown here in the living well, so, I mean, this is a heuristic model, it's not a model of how the brain works, of course. Uh, but what I think what we need to do and try to do is move a little bit closer to that other model, which is also just a model, but it's a little bit more complex, and it's also based on. Uh, the animal work is a, it's a, a really nice paper by Susan Haber and I think it's very informative. And uh, what you can see there, it's just, you know, it's not the shredded and the prefrontal cortex, but it's all these different kinds of groups. Different parts of the shredded are related to different parts of the prefrontal cortex, which we already know have different sort of functions. And uh, we already sort of leverage that uh, knowledge in, in looking at uh, individual differences in young adults and in, in interventional choices. And I'll, I'll make that really brief and I'll get into the details uh, later. Uh, but what we did is also looking at these different uh, cortical straight loops and looking at the connectivity strength, the structural connectivity strength of these loops and associate these with behavior in this discounting task. And we found interesting uh, different patterns. For instance, the, if you look at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we see a negative slope. If you look at the amygdala, we see a positive slope. And what that means is the stronger the connectivity between the amygdala and the uh, ventral striatum, the more impulsive individuals were, and the stronger the connection to the DLPSC and, uh, and the dorsal uh, striatum, the less impulsive the individuals were. And these were actually independent effects. And, and when we saw that, we thought, well, this is a very interesting way of also going into the developmental, uh, extend this to the developmental group and see if we can use that to understand uh, in more detail what's going on in the developmental world. So, I mean, that was the goal of the study, basically looking at that typically in real detail and, and um, associate that with the impulsive, impulsivity in the discounting task. Uh, also look at uh, some other sort of behavioral measures, uh, and finally also add uh, brain function. I think that's another, when I look at the developmental uh, uh, literature, still we have a lot of structural and a lot of functional papers, but not many that try to integrate that, and maybe that's because it's really hard and this didn't work, uh, but we also try to do that in, in, in this uh, study. So, yeah, just to be very so what we did uh, in this study, we had a group of 50 uh, participants between 8 and 25, the details I think are on the next slide, but, uh, and they all performed this intertemporal choice task. And um, again, uh, they did it actually twice, before they went into the scanner they did it once, and, um, and when, based on that task we estimated their discount factor, and next we used that again, to actually uh, generate a subject-specific uh, set of choices. And I think this is actually very important, uh, maybe it's not that important, but I think it's very important, because for all of these decision uh, tasks, it's very important that you do something like this, because if you don't do that, that you actually, now we, what we, what 
what it results in is that the decision, the set of decisions or choices within the task are the same for each subject in, in terms of subjective value. Uh, if you don't do that and you offer the same objective value to all of the participants, basically you give them a different choice set and the development of differences in that time might actually just because of that, not any nature of So I give you next to this. Uh, uh, what we did next, in all the age-related uh, analysis that we did, we looked at three different age trends, basically the adolescent the emerging one, which is going up and then stays stable, uh, the adolescent peak, and the linear interview. And of course, in the regression models, you obviously also test the inverse of all of these. And then uh, we looked at the ones that were significant, and the Bayesian model compared to see which one is actually a better fit, and that those that fit the best actually shown in all the graphs. So what we see here, and, and just focus on the middle one, uh, this is just a replication of many other studies. We find that the discount factor decreases with age. And, and we see that the, the, the biggest change is actually early in adolescence and actually stable in this group. I'll, I'll skip the immediate see effects that ask me about it in the community. But it's a no effect in the So next we looked at this uh, future orientation and present individual. So these are two subscales of Symbiro's time perspective index. And uh, they have some idea of you know, uh, time perspective. <coughs> and uh, what we found also is replication of early results that the future orientation increases with age. And um, th th that's also related with the correlation. So the more future oriented you are, also the more uh, patient you are in these uh, experiments. Now, if we look at present hedonism, we found some interesting results in terms of the individual differences before, but we don't find any developmental differences uh, within this group. And, um, and therefore, also no relation between present hedonism and uh, this kind. Or as we correct for age, we replicated earlier results that showed before that if you're more pre uh, present hedonistic, you're also more uh, impatient. And we can come back later also why we might have not find anything else with um, Looking at the other uh, uh, thing that I mentioned before, looking at the motor inhibition class, again we replicated something that was found many, many times before. Uh, the older the participants get, the better they become in interpreting the you know, older they initiate movements. However, this does not correlate with the given task. So, these two together uh, suggest that, at least in this age range, it's not a development, it's not really inhibiting the immediate response of trying to get the immediate reward, but rather um, uh, something else, which is related to um, more future oriented goals. Maybe. Um, so, now to brain, because uh, I think it's interesting how we know maybe it's future orientation, but what would that be mean in terms of maybe a possible mechanism, or how would that, uh, what would that mean in terms of, uh, yeah, development? And here, uh, here I'll try to briefly explain what we did and how we did the segmentation of this rating. Um, it's a standard technique, but uh, I guess it's not maybe very well known, so here we go. So what we did for every individual, we had the same set of target ROIs that were based on their service. Uh, we also extracted individually for everybody in their striatal region. And then what we did based on the diffusion data is generate uh, a whole bunch of tracks based on the diffusion data we could have which is probabilistic, so we generate 5,000 tracks for each box of the stratum. And for those 5,000, we're just going to look where do we end up in brain, in which one of those target areas. And then we get probability maps for each of the different target areas. And basically, if it's a probability of 80%, that would mean for the single voxel from the 5,000 uh, tracks that were generated from that based on the diffusion data, uh, 4,000 end up in the total level of 340. So for every voxel, we have these probabilities that are associated with each of the target areas. And what we do that next is very simple. 
you look which has the highest probability of going to each of the one of those target area. So if it's, it has the highest probability to go to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we assign it to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So it's a very simple rule. Uh, and what you end up with is very nice, uh, so what you see here on the bottom, where they're sort of color coded for the corresponding target areas, is this ventral or this dorsal to ventral uh, uh, organization, and also very nicely contiguous uh, regions, because it's done voxel by voxel, so it could look like a complete mix, but it's actually very nice. And um, and you have a specific organization of the stratum for every subject in your study. And if you look at, which is uh, how, how well they sort of, you know, how consistent they are between individuals, we can also look at the dice coefficient, which is some sort of estimation of how, how much they overlap in the 3D space, and that's actually pretty good. And if you look at if that changes with age, or the size changes with age, then we don't find any difference. So, so it seems like that structural organization of this triad is already sort of fixed. Uh, and we use the same diffusion data, and I can uh, and also to have a measure of connectivity strength. And just as with any of the other sort of standard uh, measures, this for of course have to tell, as we saw in the first opening talk, what that really means in terms of frame structure, both like what's on the line that and the nation and really actually tell about the main things. But um, we can go into that later. But we see if we use this uh, measure of uh, track probability for each of these different segments, so for each of the different tracks that we identify, we see that with age, almost all of them show an increase, uh, except for two, uh, but also they show a positive trend. Uh, which is, again, it's not so surprising, but what we're interested in was looking at which of those tracks are also showing association with, with task behavior, so with impulsivity in the task. And then we only find actually two, uh, consistent with the previous study, for the dorsal level of the cortex, as well as the ventral level of the prefrontal cortex. So this negative uh, correlation, what that means, if there's a stronger connectivity, there's a smaller discount factor. So a stronger connectivity means more patients. So that is also in an expected direction. So the simple picture that this paints is, okay, so with age, we see some change in structural connectivity, in, within that dorsal lateral prefrontal tract, and that results um, in the less discount. Of course, how exactly changes structurally uh, results in change in behavior, I think, is, is the big question. So, for that, we turn to also the functional data, so they also perform this task in the scanner uh, we did um, FMI, standard FMI research. And uh, looking at that, we found a couple of very interesting things uh, that connect very nicely, I think, to the structure of the results. So first of all, we just put here the main contrast, choosing the larger layer option versus the smaller smaller option. And we find uh, actually almost exactly the same two areas, the, the right dorsal level prefrontal cortex and the ventral level prefrontal cortex, are involved in choosing the larger layer option, the more patient have. If you now look at the same contrast and then see what changes with age, you actually see that well, they, the only errors that we find are two regions in the striatum and less than the JHI. We can talk about that later, but I'm going to work for now. Interestingly, so we do not find a, a change in local activity in the DLPC or DLPC. And so that seems to be stable across uh, age groups, but we do find this change in the striatum. And the interesting uh, region here, which I highlight, is dorsal striatum, because that is also overlapping with the segment that we found earlier to be correlated, uh, uh, associated with the dorsal lateral tract. And if we zoom in to that area to see what this age effect really is, well, there's a couple things going on. There's a main effect, and this is what I think. Uh, that people reported earlier, maybe so a little bit more activation in general in the striatum for the younger uh, versus the older participants, but we also have this interaction. So uh, we see that there's even more reduced activity for choosing when people choose the larger data, the patient option, 
in Israel versus when they choose the immediate people. And that effect is significantly bigger for the older person than the participants. So, this already suggests there's something happening between that activity in Dorsal Africa from the cortex and in the stratum. And of course, we already showed also that the connectivity, the structural connectivity between those uh, was also implicated in the behavior in the past. So, to put everything together, we now also look within those tracts, so connecting the functional ROI with the segment that is according to our you know, segmentation analysis should be connected to it, looking in that specific tract, looking at the functional connectivity, and is that the functional connectivity change depending on choice. And we did find that for the uh, right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And uh, what it shows is actually there's negative coupling in general, and there's no negative coupling when choosing the larger layer uh, option. So what that means is there's increased activity in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you actually need more decreased activity in the in that straight area. And um, so and that, that pattern moves of even more negative coupling. Of course, it's consistent, but we see here that also led more uh, about the decreased activation of uh, Now, and then the, the, the final thing that we did, because of course um, that suggests this increased the functional coupling, uh, we, we asked is that related to also this increased in structural coupling? And the answer is yes. Uh, interestingly, so this is again negative, but that means increased structural connectivity leads to more negative coupling, which is a, a big thing for us. And what kind of falls out of that is, of course, also that the functional connectivity is also related to the behavior in the past. So that's a whole, a whole kind of big how it results. But I think. Uh, this is sort of the bigger picture, it makes it very simple. And so with age, we find that there's changes in the structural connectivity within that specific tract, which leads to increased functional connectivity. And that uh, might, and I just thought about that now, it might lead to re the reduction of activity here in striated, and that then again leads to difference in behavior being uh, less uh, impulsive when you grow older. So the, the idea is that, um, I guess, the, there is more efficiency because we didn't see any change in local activity in the BLPC. So that was the same for all age groups. But we somehow, because maybe because of there's more structural integrity, that leads to a more efficient information exchange between that region and the substrate, and that leads to uh, differences in behavior. And I don't, so I don't think this is uh, some sort of impulse control because we don't, we then have other data that supports it. That they're not really suppressing their first initial idea to get the money now, but it's rather sort of an integration of information of, about abstract future goals, which might actually also be social things we're going to talk about that later, to update sort of the value representation in the, the, the midline structures, right? And specifically the striatum. Um, and I'm very, you know, interested in thinking about, it, based on the previous talk, like where is this change in structural connectivity also coming from? And so this is not just something that happens, uh, it's probably also experience dependent. And, uh, but of course we cannot really say anything about that based on this uh, section of study. Um, right, so this is just the same summary. Uh, yeah, another thing that I found interesting, and I think it's also more for, for the discussion, is that you see that there's initially a lot of change and that sort of and stabilizes, but we also see that there is a lot of a big sort of diversity here. So that it might represent, of course, it's cross sectional, but different developmental trajectories where some of them uh, stay at the same level almost, so they don't really get like more patient, but some are very patient. And I, I, I would also find it interesting to talk about that. Uh, and then it says puberty development versus age, and that's just because we looked at some data yesterday, which I find very interesting because uh, 
I think also in the adolescent research, this whole the puberty thing, and we tried to look at it in this data set, but it's so highly correlated with age, and in such a small group that we didn't find any, that we couldn't really look at age versus pubertal development. But if we do, and uh, this is a project uh, of Ron, uh, that's I was involved in, we, we looked at this really thin slice, basically, and then we had 72 boys, in 11 and 14, and then if you look at behavior in this task, but we look also at your hormone, specifically testosterone, we find actually very, very strong correlation between the levels of testosterone at least in the morning and uh, in more impulsive behavior on this task. And uh, I mean, we have to look more in this data, but I think it's very interesting because I also think that whatever I showed you before, this is completely, might be completely different. So, um, I generally would say I'm only telling part of the story. So then I'm like, thank you for your attention. And I'm going to make an advertisement that we have a, a postdoc a position at our group for two to three years. So if you'd like this kind of work, you'd like to live in Berlin, uh, definitely contact me. Well, the only thing is you have to work with me. Thanks. <laughs>